I put together a top 10 list of the most common mistakes that I see in the hobby of metal detecting. Now these are mistakes that I made quite a bit when I first started out and I still make some now, try not to, but I'm shocked at how many other people I see out there making these mistakes all the time, commonly. So these are things that will affect your productivity and really just your success rate as a detectorist. So let's talk about all 10 of these real quick. I've said it before and I'll say it again. To be successful at metal detecting, it's 99% skill and 99% luck. As crazy as that sounds, it's so true. I mean, I look back at some of my most incredible finds and no doubt luck had a lot to do with it. It was a major factor. But I do try to keep my skill set as honed and perfected as I can at all times. And I think that gives me a little bit of a competitive edge. And then there's also just these 10 things. Let's talk about each one of them one at a time. We'll get started right now. All right, for tip number one, we're gonna use Google Earth to illustrate this. So I'm out in the middle of nowhere and you can see there's a hill here. That's structure up on here. It's some kind of a feature that looks like it might've been a large, maybe 30 by 30 foot structure. And then you got a square feature down here. You got this big old oak tree and a little bit of a hill here, a hill here, some kind of a creek down here that uh, goes this direction. You got a culvert here crossing underneath the road. Some weirdness over here. And all this kind of stuff is interesting. All this stuff looks pretty cool. It all needs to be checked. But let's say you and your buddy pull up in a pickup truck and you guys park right here. And you get out right here and you start wandering over to this structure and you kind of go this way and he goes this way. And you turn your machine on and start working on this back side back here and there's not much going on back here and you kind of turn the corner and, and there's iron but you're not really hearing anything good yet and you come down this side and your buddy's still over here and you're kind of working your way down. Then you see this and you go, ooh, take a look at this. And you forgot all about this for a second because you're trying to find that the grass is greener somewhere else. Your buddy stays here, but you walk down here to this and you're thinking this is where everything's going to be. This is a barn and this is where they were living. So you work your way down and you're checking and not much going on here. And then you see this creek. You start walking along the edge of the creek and you're wondering, well, they had to be going down to the creek to get water and you're thinking they gotta be stuffed down in here. Then you see this big oak tree. Whoa, look at this big oak tree. They had to use that for shade. You got a hand stacked rock wall right here. Then you look up here on this hill and you're thinking, well, I wonder if they went up there and had picnics or at the very least they would've went up there to look around to see what's in the vicinity. And you go up to the hill and you check and nothing going on up there either. A couple shotgun shells and not much. Your buddy's still over here and you kind of work your way down back towards this. But while you're walking back down to get back over to here and maybe go check on him, you notice these rocks up here and this giant clump of trees and you're thinking, man, look at that. What's underneath those trees? So you're distracted and you walk up and I don't know if you're this kind of guy or not. I was kind of this person when I first started detecting and I had a buddy that I used to hunt with a lot out here, a guy named Ron Swenson. You can see my hat. This is our old YouTube channel called California Relic Adventures. And when we first started doing this, I noticed that when we go to places like this, Ron would stay in the hot zone and he was smart. He knew not to leave that area because all the stuff is going to be right there where people were living. There was a very low chance there'd be something up on the hill over here or around the tree but there was a good chance that there'd be right where there was a structure, there'd be stuff. When we were first starting out, that was me. And I learned the hard way, you know, quickly that don't leave the hot zone. This is where all the stuff's at. So let's say you walk up here to these trees and you're looking around these rocks and you're trying to get in these trees to find that treasure chest. So finally you walk back down because he's waving at you and you kind of come back down to see what's going on. And he shows you a large scent he just dug right here. And you're like, oh man, dude, check out the large scent. And then you say, you got anything else? He says, oh yeah, I got a couple. But he shows you some suspender clips, harmonica reed, you know, all the typical stuff. Cool things that he found because he stayed right here in the hot zone. You went around the back, beeline down to here, to the tree, up here, up to this hill, over here. That's what the point of this whole illustration is, is don't leave the hot zone. What I mean by that is on your first trip out, if you guys parked right here, Check this thoroughly, and if you have time throughout the day to check this thoroughly on the all, all on the outside and in the inside, you can wander over to here, and maybe the next time you come out, you can come back up here again one more time and just kind of make sure. Then you can start to expand your search zone and check 
secondary areas. This is a huge mistake that a lot of people make. There's a reason it's number one on the list. It's very common. And I suggest that you don't do this. Uh, this is not the best way to be productive. Anyway, that's my first tip. Stay in the hot zone. All right, for this next example, we're gonna use Google Earth again, and we're gonna act like we found an old map, and there's an old road that came through this area somewhere that kind of follows this curve right here. On the old map, it showed that there was a house or structure in this area, and there's some Civil War activity, so you're hoping to find bullets and buttons and anything you can around the old house. So you pull up and park right over here, and you get out and you walk past these two trees, you turn your machine on right in here somewhere, you start walking out here and swinging and right around here you get a square nail right here you hear a signal and you figure well I haven't heard nothing yet so I'll dig the first signal and see what it is and you dig it and it's an old square nail and you keep walking and you keep walking and you're swinging and swinging and there's nothing else out here and you kind of turn this way and there's nothing out here and you start thinking wait a minute that square nail is back here so you kind of head back towards where you got the square nail, hoping there's more stuff there. And you come back and you get right about here and you realize that your square nail was here and right here, you're starting to get into the iron. And then here's all the iron right here. Big patch of iron and that's where the structure was right here. Now when you first came in, if you would have stopped when you got that square nail and done this technique we're gonna talk about, you would have found this right away without walking all the way out here. What you should have done is you should have came out and got your first signal and if you're walking trying to find a patch of iron and you get a signal a square nail there's a reason why there's a square nail out in a field so what you should do is stop and think okay if that's here what else is here and then what you need to do is start doing a concentric spiral circle starting right where you dug the nail and start going out swinging so that your coil is overlapping itself every time and you're walking in big circles and had you had done that by the time you got right around here on this bottom swing you would have got into this iron all around this house and you would have found it right away and you might have found other things before you got to the iron other targets in here that could have gave you a clue and you never would have walked right past this and just continued on out into the nothingness so basically it's very simple the tip number two is when you find something that's good even if it's just a square nail, it's an indicator. Stop at your indicator and start spiraling out. Circle, circle, circle. And if you get 10 or 12 feet out and there's nothing there, you can move on. I'd say it's safe to move on to whatever you feel you know, looks the best. But at least you gave it a good towards this way where the iron gets real heavy right in here. You notice there's some kind of a feature here like a road or a path or something paths and roads were used a lot look at this it looks like almost like it goes this way you see that it's almost like you're looking at old tracks that came into where this structure was it goes out this way if you see something like that you might want to grid this this area right here because roads and paths were used a lot by foot traffic horse buggies and horseback riders and stagecoaches and everything else just foot traffic if nothing else especially in civil war areas where they usually hiked on the roads so you could do a grid pattern going back and forth overlapping your coil left and right just right across the road and you could use these edges to define where your grid pattern is going to be so this references to realize where you've been and where you're going take a second when you turn around to look back across so you know where you're to and where you came from that way you can do kind of a visual alignment as you grid so basic viral and then you got the grid and that helps you uh, hone in on a new good all right mistakes number three and number four that you might be making are related to each other we'll talk about each one real quick number three is follow up on those tips and what that means is when you're out metal detecting in a park or a school and somebody walks up to you starts talking to you listen to what they're saying especially if they start telling you about some kind of a treasure story a lost ring or something, some place that they used to go where people lost things. You know, also these tips will come in from friends and family as well. And maybe even friends and family will be talking to somebody else and they know that you metal detect and they bring you these tips. So follow up on those tips. There's some really good tips that I followed up on in the past and that's why it's on the list because they turn out to be really cool places that I went. 
and I got to meet a lot of neat people because of following up on tips. I carry a little notepad with me all the time, and when I don't have my notepad in my backpack, I will get my phone out and text myself something or text the person or exchange information with the person so that I could follow up on the tip. So I was in a park about 10 years ago. A guy walked up to me and asked me about my machine, told me that he was there 10 years prior to that, and he was metal detecting with an older machine, and he was at a park bench sitting down taking a break on a hot day, and he looked down for a minute, and he saw something underneath the bench. He saw a metal bar with an old couple sprinkler heads sticking up off of it. It was about five feet long, and it was right under the bench, and the grass had grown up all around the bar. But he could feel it down there with his feet. So he got off the bench and pulled that bar out of the grass and set it down for a second. And he figured maybe somebody lost something who sat on that bench years ago. So he turned his machine on and swung under it and found a $5 gold coin underneath that bench. Now people probably walked by there and swung near the bench, but they couldn't get up to it because of the metal bar. So follow up on tips. And that's just another tip that you just got from me. Anyway, let's go to number four. All right, mistake number four that you might be making is I want you to talk to the older generation. And what I mean by that is I want you to ask very specific questions to them. I want you to ask them, for example, where did they used to swim? Was there a swimming hole somewhere that they remember from back when coins were made of silver? And you know, was it a pond, a creek, a river, or someplace they all went that they don't go anymore? You find that spot, you might be the first person to turn a metal detector on there and start swinging it. And it could be loaded with old coins and jewelry. Think about that for a minute. Same thing with schools and parks. Instead of saying, what schools did you go to? Or what parks did you go to? Why don't you try this? Ask them, what parks did you used to go to that are no longer parks, that are gone now? Are there any parks that you could remember that may not be parks anymore? And then you might be able to find that park Again, you might be the first person to go in there where there was a swing set, a sandbox, and maybe some stuff that kind of just got grown over and forgot about, and now it's just been forgotten about. And you go in and find it, go in there, turn on, you're gonna be the first one there. Same thing, same question about schools. Are there any schools that they remember that are no longer there that you can access? So these are things that you might wanna check in uh, you can start with the older generation on this kind of stuff. I also have books like this, a lot of these little books in my collection. Here's one right here on riverboats of Northern California. In here is a whole bunch of pictures of riverboats in the Delta in California here. What if I were to ask the older generation if they ever rode on a riverboat? And they say, yes, I did when I was a kid. And then my next question would be, where did you get on? Where did you get off? Were there any stops that you remember along the waterways? Because even though I'm reading about the history of riverboats in here, I could get very specific details from somebody who actually rode on one. So just keep this all in mind. Again, this is a big mistake that you might be making by not tapping into this resource of information. So make sure you talk to the older generation. Number five, how to get permissions. So I teach a class on this on my expertdetecting.com website. I teach this class one-on-one, -on -one. I teach it to small groups, big groups, but here's the gist of it quickly. Number one, identify who the actual property owner is. Make sure you find the property owner, not a friend, family member, neighbor, you know, something like that. If you can, ask to meet the property owner in person. You can find them using phone apps like Gaia or Onyx. I'll put those down in the description down below. You can use websites, you can go to the county directly and talk to the records department and see if you can figure out who owns the land. Try to meet with that person, the landowner, in person if you can. When you first approach them, be very respectful and professional on your approach and make sure that you look nice as well, nice and professional. Don't go up there with full camo on or all your digging gear on. Tell them from the very beginning what the purpose of the request is to go on the land and be very honest about this. You may find that they have always wanted to use a metal detector on the land anyway. For example, don't tell them you're just gonna go do photography or historical research and then get caught out 
there digging holes with the metal detector, you'll probably be escorted right off the property. So don't do that. This way you'll establish trust and credibility from the very beginning. You can show them a business card, your ID, and offer at this point to do some kind of volunteer work for them. You could offer a compensation or an incentive where you will pick up garbage that you find, broken barbed wire or big pieces of metal, or report sick or injured or dead animals on the property. Or maybe you saw a mountain lion, you know, or a predator and you want to tell the landowner exactly where that happened. Maybe you're a roofer or you do landscaping or you offer some kind of bartering like that. These things are really good strategies that work. And as far as if you're looking for gold only, you want to tell them that you're willing to do a split and you'll be surprised that a lot of landowners are really willing to listen to offers like that. And then, you know, the last thing is, is you want to try to get this permission in writing. What I do is I offer a document. It's a release of liability. It's written to protect the landowner, not me. I show the release of liability. I also went out and got a liability insurance policy. It's a lot more affordable than you may think. And I have the liability insurance policy in my release of liability. So when I hand them the document, I'm asking at that point for written permission on the document and I'm giving them a full release of liability. So it's two birds with one stone. It works really good. So also when you're talking to them about this kind of thing and you're going over the writing portion, Make sure you know exactly where the boundaries are of their property. You want to know that you don't accidentally wander onto a neighbor's property. You want to know exactly where these fences are. The worst thing you could ever do is get caught on somebody else's property. Tell them that you have permission on the other person's property. Next thing you know, your original landowner is getting an angry phone call from the neighbor. So let's avoid that and make sure you know exactly where you're allowed to be and when you're allowed to be there on the property. If there's certain times of the year they don't want you in there during hunting season, the wet months, when bulls are out with the cows, any of that kind of stuff, you want that all in writing. Ensure them that you're gonna go onto the land and be very respectful of any natural or cultural resources that you may come across. You'll leave no trace of your presence. You'll leave the property in the same or better condition than you found it. So there you go. That's kind of the gist of how to get permission. So I went out and personally talked to a bunch of the landowners where I have permissions. What do you think their number one concern was? I have a list of concerns here that landowners might have, but what do you think their number one concern was? If you guess liability, you're right. That is their number one concern, especially here in California. Let's take a look at a clip right now about that. Here we go. All right, so the obvious number one concern for any property owner is gonna be just liability. And we're on the Insurance Information Institute website. This is a graph for last year. 2022, you can see each state listed on here. If you look at the overall, the United States was half over half a billion dollars paid out just last year and property casualty insurance claims. And if you look at like my state, California, there was 63 million paid out last year, but Alaska only had 879,000. So you have to kind of look at the population of each state and do some math to figure out where they rank as far as the worst to the best. I'm sure that my state's up there towards the top of being some of the worst. It's a very litigious state that we live in and our property owners here are just nervous wreck about liability and you can see why so let's move on to some other concerns real quick all right i think most of you guys got that right you guessed that liability would be their number one concern how about number two what's their number two concern if you guessed fires you got that right let's take a look at this clip real quick investigators say the crushed fire that ignited yesterday afternoon just south of paso robles was sparked by a car's catalytic converter the devices heat up quickly and can be very dangerous ksby news reporter alexa bertola is live in san luis obispo scott and karina the good news is that yesterday's fire is 100 percent contained it was started by a catalytic converter which made us wonder how does that happen so underneath the vehicle you have the exhaust system that kind of goes underneath the vehicle along the way. This right here is actually the catalyst converter. A catalytic converter helps a car run cleaner. This burns all the pollutant emissions through the system out of the tailpipe, so it reduces it. And when it comes out of the tailpipe, it's less harmful to the human body. That's the way it's supposed to work. But if your catalytic converter isn't working correctly, it can really heat up. That's when the trouble starts for this honeycomb looking piece inside of it. When a cat's really bad and starts deteriorating and breaking apart, the honeycomb will actually break off inside the cat and come out of the exhaust system and shoot out out of the muffler. Fire investigators say that's what happened Thursday. 60 acres were charred. This is a piece of exhaust carbon from a vehicle 
that uh, passed through the area here that uh, actually ignited this fire. All right, yeah, fire, that is scary stuff, especially here in California where we get these crazy fires. Keep in mind that a lot of the landowners live on their land. So you can see where that deep-rooted fear comes from. Number three, let's talk about number three real quick. It's hunting and hunters being on the land. And what they're concerned about is you being out there and accidentally getting shot, number one, or number two, scaring away game that the hunters are there to find. So I'm sure you can figure that out as far as the safety standpoint and the business side of it. So if you're a landowner anywhere in the world, really, and you're sitting on hundreds or thousands of acres of land and it's just sitting there year after year, it's generating taxes that they have to pay on it. Wouldn't it be nice if your land could at least pay its own taxes somehow? One of the ways that they bring in this income stream is, you know, of course, cattle ranching. They let uh, cattle ranchers come in and lease the land to raise cattle or they may put cell phone towers in their land somewhere and have the cell companies pay a yearly fee. But very common here is for hunters to be able to come into the property and hunt. All right, so we talked about the big three already. We talked about liability, fire, and hunters. That's all dangerous stuff. Let's talk about some other things now. Fences, they have fences up on their property and they don't want you going through the fences, cutting the fences, damaging them in any way. In fact, what they like you to do is to report when you see damage on their fences or even offer to help fix the fence. That's something that I do here. I went and took some classes on how to repair barbed wire fences and I carry a set of lineman pliers with me. When I'm out in the wild and I see a problem, I fix it if I can. If not, I report it to the landowner. But fences are important. Let's take a look at that right now. All right, so if you have to cross a fence and you can't jump over it and you have to go through it, you might end up crossing the barbed wire like this. Make sure you take the time to uncross that barbed wire when you get on the other side. If not, you're leaving a big gap in the fence and that's one real quick way to upset your landowner. All right, another concern could be the speed limit and dust. Let's take a look at that real quick. If you're driving down roads inside a private property and you see a structure, a house, or a sign like this, make sure you slow way down on these old dusty roads because what you're gonna do is kick up a whole bunch of dust and just upset the landowner or the person living in the home who might call the landowner. So pay attention to signs like this and slow way down when you're near people or structures on these old dirt roads. So another concern is for you to stay on roads with your vehicle. It could be a dirt road, it could be a paved road, but don't go off road. Don't go out there and go off of a road and go up into some canyon because it's easier for you to just drive to it rather than walk to it. Number one, that comes back to the fire safety thing. Number two, if it's wet or rainy, you're gonna leave trenches. They just don't want you guys going off-road. Keep that in mind. Number nine is pretty obvious. I don't think that anyone watching this, hopefully none of you watching this right now would have this be an issue. But if you're packing it in, you gotta pack it out. They just don't want your trash. They don't wanna see your Coke cans, your Pepsi cans, uh, your cigarette butts. By the way, smoking is a real concern. It comes right back to fire. So keep that in mind. If you're smoking or if you're thinking about any kind of open flame, activities that goes right back to the number two concern which is fire they don't want to see that they're nervous wreck if you're out there smoking but getting back to what i'm talking about if you're bringing trash in pack it in and pack it out don't leave any trace that you were there at all and you'll be welcome back next time all right this list of concerns that i made after having talked to landowners is not a complete list it's just the things i decided to tell you about here's the last thing on my list what i think you should do first of all is go talk to your landowner especially if it's a new permission or even an old permission and ask them point blank and write down what their concerns are so that you know maybe there's a couple concerns you never thought about. So just keep that in mind. But this last concern is called first right of refusal. And it's kind of common sense, but here with me, it's been a good policy for me to show everything that I find to the landowner before I just go home with it. So I take the time and I take pride in this and I sleep good at night when I do this. I go up to the landowner and show them everything that I found. And sometimes I'm kind of shaking in my boots hoping that they don't keep something that I really want. But that's really never happened to me more than a couple times. And even then, I was perfectly okay with it. I found so many cool things in my life metal detecting, I certainly don't need to hide something from a landowner. So I go up and show them all these cool things that I found and ask them, is there anything here that you want? And sometimes they say yes. But most of the time, at least with my experience, they say no. And I go home with it knowing, you know, I have a warm, fuzzy feeling that I should at least showed it to them. And that way, if it makes a video or something, there's no surprises. So 
keep that in mind. That's something that's very important. Me and my buddy Ron from California Relic Adventures back in our old YouTube days on the California Relic Adventures YouTube channel, we would go out to these landowners and we'd take all the things that we found, all the cool stuff, and we'd print out an old map and we'd put it in the back of a shadow box. So it was the background of a shadow box. And then with the glass in the front, we put in things that we found on the property and just spread them all out and made a really cool shadow box and we'd present it to the landowner. And they absolutely loved that idea. That was a huge, uh, it was one of Ron's ideas. It was a huge thing that really helped us to gain their trust and respect. So maybe something for you to think about something for you guys to do. Again, here's my list. It's not complete, but let's move on to the next part of this video. All right, once you turn your machine on, you wanna to try to get your sensitivity turned up as high as you can. In this case, on this machine, it goes up to 25. I'm gonna sneak up and listen very carefully. And it looks like I can run it at max sensitivity without any issues, no EMI. So you're gonna to wanna to have your sensitivity up before you do your ground balance or your noise cancel because a noise cancel, especially done on a low sensitivity, could be quite different than it is on a high sensitivity. So you want it as high as you're gonna run it before you do the noise cancel. So the first thing on this machine, over here you'll see, is noise cancel. So I'll toggle over to noise cancel. I got my sensitivity up now. Let's go ahead and do a noise cancel. and it's listening to all the frequencies to see which one is the quietest and the machine will land on that frequency and select it so that it can minimize the amount of electrical magnetic interference you can get from your cell phone or maybe other machines that are near you. After that, you can see here we have ground balance. Let's go ahead and do a ground balance. I'm gonna hold this button in and pump the coil until it quiets all the way down. And we're from 12 to 35, look at that. So now I hit the detect button and we're ready to go. So I got my sensitivity up, I did a noise cancel, now I've done a ground balance and the machine is optimized. This is a huge mistake that I see so many detectors doing and I'm talking people that have been detecting like as long as I have, 35 years and I'm just as guilty as anybody. I'll get out of the car, turn the machine on, it sounds good, it's not really chattery or unstable and I just take off and detect. You should take an extra second to do this to get everything you can out of the machine so it's running as optimal as possible. So you want your sensitivity up as high as you can, a nice stable noise cancel, and then a good ground balance. And then you can start detecting knowing that the machine is running as optimal as it can. All right, gonna talk to you guys about swing speed. Before I do that, I've actually seen this in a park one time. A guy just bought his machine and he was doing this in the park. We know better than that, right? We gotta keep the coil down flat, keep it as low as we can. Keep it on the ground nice and flat. Now you can slow down your swing speed and keep it real focused like if you're gritting and just real slow and just creep it along like this in a little focused area. You can also do slow swing speed way out here and paint a big picture. Then you could go to a medium swing speed which is pretty typical if you're just trying to cover some ground. This is about what I look like on an average detecting trip right here. Anything faster than this, you're asking for trouble. You don't want to be swinging this fast. No matter how fast your processor is, you're going to be missing stuff. So this is out of the question. You don't want to swing like this. I just don't recommend it. I would recommend that you experiment a little bit and see what your machine likes. Some people think that machines like a real slow swing speed on some settings and on other settings, you may be able to get away with about this. Anything more than that, you're asking for trouble. So having the right size coil is super important. If you own a couple different size coils for your machine, you should always bring them with you on your detecting trip because you never know there's a right time and place for all the different size coils. So I have a little six inch round on here. That's the smallest coil I have for this machine. And you can see that it's a double D design. That means it gives just a, like a little knife edge blade look into the ground. It's six inches long, the knife blade, and it's six inches deep. So as I swing this through a whole bunch of iron, nails or whatever, I'm real likely to hear a coin kind of hiding in between nails with this small little coil. But I wouldn't have as much luck if I was out there swinging this thing in the iron because it's gonna hear multiple nails at one time and not the coin. But there's a time and place for this big coil too. So if you're out in a park and you're on a ball field where there's not a lot of signals, there's no nails, no trash, 
and it's pretty quiet out there, it's, it's you don't want to be swinging this little, painting a little tiny picture on top of the grass with this little thing, and you're not going to get any coverage. There's no need to have a little small coil that's not going to go very deep out in the middle of a field where you don't have a situation where you have iron. So that's where this comes into play. And you get this out there and swinging in that big open field area. Now you can go down 15 inches deep with that same double D blade, but it's a 15 inch long and 15 inch deep blade. So basically this is something you wanna take out into an area where you don't have a lot of iron and you just want pure depth. Now in between this are several different sizes. I like this little design here. It gives you that six inch wide to get between the nails, but it also gives you a little more coverage from this distance here. So this is actually a 5.5 inch by 8.5 inch. So you get eight and a half inches of toe, head, heel to toe size, and you get that good knife blade going in that much distance, eight and a half inches of a knife blade going down about five and a half inches, six inches deep into the ground. So this is kind of a combination of something you would use in the iron and something you would use on the fringe of the iron. Then you have kind of an all purpose, all around general size here, kind of the 12 inch. You get the 12 inch this way and the nine inch this way. Again, this is a double D. So there's a right coil for every situation. Make sure that if you are out in a, in a place where you know you're gonna be in a big open field and you should have this on, it would be, you would be more productive to bring this along with you and take a few minutes to switch it out before you hit that field. And if you're out there with this little guy, you're just not gonna hear that much ground and you're gonna miss things. And like I say, productivity is out the window. It's gonna take you forever to scan the same area that you could have scanned with this in a fraction of the time. All right, so we made it to the end of the video. This is my 10th and final mistake that you might be making. Probably not, I'll tell you what it is. Maybe some of you are not making this mistake, but before I do, I wanna tell you that I apologize. The video went a little bit longer than I thought it would. When I got into that permission section, there's just so much to talk about in there, but I hope that I gave you the information and courage that you need to go out and get those permissions, super important. And it's a very, very cool thing to be able to drive onto a property not have anybody watch, looking at you over your back, not have to worry about anything, and you get to go out there at your leisure, relax, and you know sometimes you're able to drive right to a site. So go out there and get those permissions, at least try. You might get a few denials, you might get several denials, but you'll get better at it, and eventually you'll get that really good permission. So, 10th and final thing, let's talk about that real quick. I have a few items here on the table. This is what I do. What I want you to do is I want you to make a test garden in your yard. Find yourself an area in your front or backyard, somewhere in the grass if you can, or in the dirt, where your spouse is not gonna get upset with you or your family, mom, dad, whatever it is. And you wanna get, this is what I do, I use these rubber fender washers. They're flexible, I paint them white and I write on them with permanent ink about what is down below this rubber washer. Then I use this item which is made for auto body uh, attachments. I'll put a link up on the screen to show you what the part numbers are on these and where I got them. And I'll show you right now. I just simply push this through there and it's got hard plastic on the top, rubber here, and you push it down on the ground and it's white and it has writing on it. It's a really good marker. At my old house, I actually color coded these rubber washers, painted them different colors like yellow and green and still wrote on them, but it was neat just to look down and see the colors. Uh, some people use golf tees, so you could use white hard plastic uh, fender washers like this, right on those, push them in the ground. Just don't use anything metal, obviously. Plastic, rubber, and wood are fine, but you don't want anything that you're gonna detect. I've seen a lot of really clever ideas. I've even seen spray paint just right on the spot where the item is. But anyway, you wanna bury, get yourself a post hole digger, go out there and dig. With the post hole digger, you get holes about that big. Go down and dig down at various depths Say for example, you're gonna bury a US silver dime and you wanna to listen to it with your machine. So you dig down, you get to like eight inches or so, drop the coin in there, put the plug back in, listen to it if it's not quite deep enough because you want it to be right on the fringe of detectability so that you can learn from it. 
you want to learn what an item, a desirable target sounds like at depth. So you want to dig down a little bit more and get it down. Maybe you come down to around nine and a half, ten 10 inches, get that diamond there right, right when you like where it's at. Then you're, you seal it up, you're done and put your marker on there. <clears throat> After about three to four or five months of watering it and just weather, the coin will actually start to leach out like it does in, in the wild. And, you know, some of these guys that have test gardens that are five, six, seven, ten years old, man, they got it dialed. The coin has already started to leach out a little bit into the soil, some of the elements from the silver or the nickel, gold, whatever they have in the ground. And it just makes it more real world. So over time, your coin garden will sound even better and be more useful. But until then, you got to get out there and make yourself a coin garden you know, bury some coins. Also, don't forget to bury a few things like maybe you want to bury a rusty bottle cap. Hear what that sounds like. Maybe you want to bury some square nails. Hear what those sound like. And also, don't forget to maybe bury a square nail near a coin so that you can swing over that and listen and see if you can catch that coin two or three, four inches off that square nail. And that way, you know, you're learning something from your test garden. And like I said, this might be the funnest of the 10 possible mistakes you're making of all these. So go out there and make yourself a coin guard and get that going. You gotta have that. That's something that will help you hone your skills and give you that edge. All right guys, that's it for the video. Again, apologize, I went a little bit longer than I thought it would. I left a lot of stuff on the table here. If you have any questions, as always, go down below in the comment section, ask me questions, leave comments. I try to answer all of them. It just takes time, but I try to answer them. If I see a question, I put a priority on the question over the comments. So I'm always uh, trying to get the questions answered first. If you're a member on my channel, you know, you're, you joined up as one of the, uh, my members, which you can see down here and, and click on memberships. Um, I will definitely answer your questions before anything else as well. You get priority on that. So anyway, that's it for now. Catch you guys real soon. Thanks for hanging out. Take care.